Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. So this is a continuation of my Quest for Power series. I've got videos on cylinder configurations, supercharging, turbo supercharging, also water and nitrous injection, so be sure to check those ones out also. But let's dive into this one. So far, to get more power out of our reciprocating piston engines, we've added more cylinders, we've made them bigger, then we've used blowers of various kinds to push in more air, we've tinkered with fuel-air mixtures, and we've injected methanol and water into the mix. Today we're going to talk about fuel, and more specifically, the most important World War II aviation fuel of them all, gasoline. The origins of gasoline can be traced back to the early 19th century when crude oil was first distilled to produce kerosene for lighting. Before this, whale oil was actually the primary source of liquid fuel for lighting. Gasoline was actually a byproduct of the process of making crude oil into kerosene and initially was considered a waste product and was often discarded. The advent of the internal combustion engine in the late 19th century marked a turning point for gasoline. In 1876, Nicholas Otto developed the four-stroke engine, which used gasoline as a fuel. This innovation laid the groundwork for the widespread adoption of gasoline-powered vehicles. To meet the growing demand, oil companies invested heavily in refining technologies. The development of thermal cracking in the 1910s, pioneered by William Burton, allowed refiners to break down heavier hydrocarbons into lighter ones, increasing gasoline yields. The process was later enhanced by catalytic cracking in the 1930s, which used catalysts to improve efficiency and produce higher octane fuels. Uh-oh, now I've used the O word, and so we need to talk about octane. And this is going to get a little complicated, and also I've simplified it down a bit, so you gearheads out there, please cut me some slack here. Contrary to its use in marketing and general slang, octane does not mean power. In truth, it is two things. One, it is a physical component of gasoline. And secondly, it is a rating system to measure resistance to knocking. First, let's look at octane as a chemical. Gasoline is not one thing, but rather a blend of components. Octane is one of the components, along with heptane, and many others. Adding octane, whose chemical name is actually 2,2,4-trimethylpentene, to the gasoline blend was found to reduce knocking. While increasing the amount of heptane did the opposite, it increased knocking. So a rating system was devised where in a lab, Pure octane was burned in a test engine and its tendency to knock was given the rating of 100. In the same conditions, pure heptane was also burned in the test engine and its tendency to knock was given the rating of 0. So blends of gasoline are then tested and given a number that compares to that scale. And that is the second thing that octane is, which is a rating scale that shows the amount of resistance to knocking a gasoline blend has. So I can hear you out there saying, okay, Brian, what does this have to do with our aircraft engines? And can you refresh me on what knocking is? Well, if you think back to the episodes on super and turbo supercharging and water ejection, remember that the higher the engines compressed, the fuel-air mixtures, the more efficient and powerful they could be. But they always ran up against a limit where the fuel would explode before the timed spark, causing knocking. Once the engine started knocking, it would produce no higher power and could be damaged. 
Higher octane fuel would prevent that knocking and allow for even more squeezing power and efficiency. In the early 1930s, motor fuel for trucks and cars had a rating of about 40 octane, while aviation gasoline, known as Avgas, had a rating of 70 to 80 octane. The oil companies cared the most about selling motor fuel because at the time, aviation gasoline amounted to less than one half percent of total gasoline consumption. Making higher octane rated gasoline by adding additives such as tetraethyl lead was possible, but crazy expensive to produce. Who the heck was going to buy this stuff when it cost $30 per gallon compared to $0.20 cents per gallon for regular motor fuel? And this is 1930s money we're talking about too. So it set up a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Who was going to build the high compression engines to burn this type of fuel if it wasn't available? And who was going to make the fuel if it had no market? Somebody needed to break the impasse, and that someone was James H. Jimmy Doolittle. Yes, the raid on Tokyo guy, and the future general in the U.S. AAF's air war in Europe. Of all the personalities from that era, I'd love to have a beer with Jimmy Doolittle. Not only was he extraordinarily brave... He was also both famous as an air racer and already had the Distinguished Flying Cross for record-breaking flights even before the war broke out. But he was also crazy smart. He was awarded MIT's first doctorate in aeronautical engineering. In the early 1930s, Doolittle began this dance between Shell Oil the U.S. Army procurement folks and engine manufacturers to break the chicken-egg dilemma. He got the manufacturers to make the high-compression engines, Shell to make the high-octane fuel, and the Army to buy enough of it. He was probably the only personality that could have done it, with his fame, his smarts, and his status in the Army. By the time of the Battle of Britain, there was sufficient production for supplies of 100 octane fuel to help win that battle. Tim Paluka, in the journal Innovation and Technology in 2005, wrote, open quotes, Luftwaffe pilots couldn't believe that they were facing the same planes that they had fought successfully over France a few months before. The planes were the same, but the fuel wasn't, close quotes. Well, not quite true. The engines did need to be modified to handle the new fuel, but it was worth it. Converting from 87 to 100 octane fuel increased the RAF's Spitfires and Hurricanes top speed by 25 to 34 miles per hour, up to 10,000 feet. That's a battle-winning difference. So why did the Luftwaffe not adopt 100 octane fuel? There's not a simple answer to the question. Yes, initially they were behind in the technology, although they certainly knew how to make 100 octane fuel. Then it was a combination of shortages of the components to not only make the fuel, but also support the metallurgy required to modify the engines to handle the higher compressions. Lastly, pressure from Allied bombing raids on production facilities did not help. And I have even read that the push for jets in Germany was partly because you could skip the whole high-octane gasoline dilemma process and jump to producing high power with a very low-grade fuel that is essentially kerosene, which is where we started this topic. Jet engines are so unpicky for fuel they could probably even run them on whale oil. Japan had almost the same problems as Germany, except add in that all their crude oil was shipped in from overseas, and their oil tankers were eventually being sunk in droves from U.S. torpedoes and mines. But 100 octane fuel was certainly a little known but major contributor to victory in the air, which of course 
helped lead to victory everywhere. We will probably only have one more video on this series, and that one will be on turbo compounding, although I may bundle it with some words on rocket and jet power. Either way, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell to never miss any new content. Why not become a member to get bonuses such as extra episodes, loyalty badges, the use of special Warbird emojis, shoutouts, and priority reply to comments, as well as the satisfaction of knowing that you are supporting the channel. Until next time.